the next section, we're going to talk about how SADS has actually affected people. And we're going to play you a video <coughs> made by Jess O'Brien, age 15, um, who's turning out to be an absolute video expert. And it's a, I think it's a six or seven minute, six minute video where we're going to play you what, uh, what it, it meant to Laura and Joe's sister. And then she's going to interview other people about what they think about CPR and AED distribution. Joe, I, I like to think he was my little brother, but he just wasn't. He was six foot three, a huge giant, and would it was a very, very lovable, fantastic person. Um, he was like, um, he was more than a brother. He was like a best friend, and I was very, very lucky because we got on like house on fire, not like the usual brothers and sisters who kill each other all the time. He would permanently move me around the house because he was so much taller than me. So if I was in his way, rather than ask, he'd shove me and pick me up and remove me. So arty, it was really creative um, and had a real love of art. Um, I was just, just very cool, which definitely didn't pass down my side. So he, he was just a lot of fun and um, had just very, very lovely and caring and worry, would worry over everyone and everything. Um, yeah, that was Joe. So Joe was out with his best friend um, running and um, all of a sudden, he left his best friend just before, where, near where we live. And what they think happened was he ran um, about 30 meters and just collapsed. And what they've found out um, caused that was a genetic heart um, condition, which caused a rush of adrenaline to his heart, and which was a bit too big and stopped his heart from um, and just gave up. Um, so that was what caused Joe to collapse. But how that kind of linked to the CPR is that if someone around him had been trained um, I mean a, an amazing gentleman across the road tried to bring him back but um, couldn't but if that had been successful and they had managed to bring his heart get, to get going again that could have saved his life so um, that that's what happened on that night. So SADS is sudden arrhythmogenic death syndrome so it's normally brought about by some genetic abnormality, whether it be electrical or morphological. Um, normally means you're prone to life-threatening heart rhythms. Um, so if that can be picked up at screening, you can be treated beforehand, or if not, usually results in a life-threatening event at some point. Well, if it's in um, an emergency situation, Obviously, uh, basic life support, CPR, um, and defibrillation is the key. Uh, which I think it's given rise to the amount of external defibrillators you see around uh, phone boxes, libraries, on town halls, village halls, and that sort of thing nowadays. Do you know CPR? Yeah. You do. I know it saves lives. Can you do it? I can do it. Can you? Do you know what an AED is? No. Do you know what an AED is? No. Yeah, it's a machine that, that instructs you through the process of, um, well, essentially restarting someone's heart, stopping it and then restarting it. Can you tell me your thoughts on whether we should teach CPR in schools? I learnt it when I was nine in junior school when we started swimming lessons, so yes, I do. I think they should, yes, yes, because it's a lifesaver, isn't it? I, I think definitely that um, CPR should be a fundamental part of education. Proper life-saving skills that children can use and young people can use, I think, is fundamental. And we need to teach children to be, and young people to become all-rounded, not just biology boffins or maths boffins. They need to be people of the world, and I think that's a really important skill to have. It's vital, really because it is the first line against any sort of emergency situations that you could come into. Kids pick things up very quickly and very easily. It's a bit of a no-brainer really. Why wouldn't you do it? Probably more of a question. Um, I think nowadays I'm seeing pri in primary uh, children, if you like, are getting older earlier um, and I think children aren't too young in primary to learn CPR and it's something particularly near five, six, that I think they'll be more than capable of helping and supporting their peers and anyone else. I've never actually properly understand it but I think you push where their heart is so the air comes out of their mouth so they can breathe again. I think CPR is where you have to find the middle of their ribs uh, then you have to lock your hands over and lay them on the ground and push really hard and it, it like keeps their heart pumping. To help somebody if they've like like heart attacks or if they've 
allergies sometimes when they've like fainted or something and they're not like breathing properly or something. Then you try and give them as much air as possible into their lungs so they can keep breathing. Um, I think because it's becoming a teacher, I always thought children were too young. Um, but seeing year sixes and the size of year sixes now, um, so most of them are taller than me now when I walk down the corridors. And I'm, I'm definitely of the opinion that in the next few years that's something we need to focus on as a trust. Yeah, because if something happens at school in the playground, there's no teachers around, then we can do it to help them. I think it'd be good to learn about CPR because um, if it like happens in a class, you would like know what to do. Maybe in middle school, not primary because some people will mess around. But middle school or high school, yeah. I don't think they're too young to learn it. I think they might be too young to, or they don't have the strength to do it. There is a, there's a strength issue in that. So uh, unless you can do it properly, they may be better to run for help than to run and do something they can't achieve. But if they're aware of it, then they can perhaps get somebody else to do it. There's no one's too young to save a life and I think when I did it with my class the other day it showed all oh, right they might not be able to do the compressions quite right but if they can tell an adult that's someone as a bit of a source of information. From experience at work obviously speed is of the essence and during our training we're taught that if they're not defibrillated within two or three minutes you're running the risk of um, lasting brain damage if you do bring them back from it anyway. So. It really is every second count. So that's a, a video that's not fully edited yet, but we thought we'd show it to you, which we think is a brilliant piece of work from, from somebody who's young as 15. The next person I want to introduce is another Jess. And <laughs> um, Jess Keeling is speaking to us for at least the third time at the conference now. I think <coughs> you, Jess. And uh, even though she's in university at, uh, in East Anglia, has come all the way back to Leicester today, back to home territory, to tell us about her experiences. Okay, so as Fionn said, I'm Jess, and I'm incredibly privileged to be here again, and even more privileged to be the young person's ambassador for the Joe Humphreys Memorial Trust, despite being quite old now, depressing you. <laughs> yeah, but I remain saddened, like four years on, that I'm still here under such tragic circumstances and that it's taken Joe's passing and many other young people's um, to highlight the sads in the region and beyond. And my story is a fortunate one and I'd like to briefly share it with you. So it began Easter in 2008 when I was 12 years old. I had a um, strange sharp shooting pain in my chest whilst playing football once again when walking with my grandparents. But when I rested the pain disappeared of its own accord. But my mum with all her nervousness and maternal instincts dragged me to the GP where we explained the symptoms and they immediately carried out an ECG and then the next day we were called by them and they like dragged us in and the doctor noticed there was a prolonged QT and we were immediately referred to the Glenfield. We were later told that children were coming into, children coming into the surgery with chest pains. They were doing like routine ECGs to try and pick up undiagnosed heart conditions. So in this regard I was quite lucky. And coincidentally, the chest pains were muscular and absolutely nothing to do with any underlying issue. The hospital acted swiftly, an appointment came through, and in the May, I had an echocardiogram. As mentioned earlier, it was one of the stages of the screenings. And it showed my heart was structurally and functionally normal. And it was here the registrar first mentioned long QT syndrome, and did refer to it as sudden death syndrome. I remember asking my mum on the way back, like, is it serious? Like, 12 year old stupidness. And I distinctly remember her like silence and nervous reassurance. Yeah. And she since articulated that it was really difficult to like, remain composed. But yeah, obviously she did another thing. I was like, yeah, it's fine. And then a few weeks later I had a 24 hour ECG and an exercise test. And once again they showed a long QT. And Dr. Duke, my consultant at the time, suggested an adrenaline test to try and determine the problem for good and get a, like, a conclusive diagnosis. The results came back and they did suggest a long QT and it kind of confirmed Dr. Duke's suspicions of me having long QT syndrome. And at the time he yeah, clearly and explicitly advised, advised me not to play competitive sport. But coincidentally, at the same time of these heart investigations, I had a letter from the FA saying I had international potential yeah, I literally lived for football, so it was like devastating. Um, yeah, I remember saying to Dr. Jude that like football was my life, really dramatic. 
But um, yeah, as a family, we discussed how much sport meant to us and me personally. So we went against the medical advice, and my parents agreed I could still play, still play sport, as did the FA. But this was on the understanding that taking medication, beta blockers, would reduce the risk of anything happening by about 95%. And Leicester City, Leicester City Academy agreed I could still play for them. And they were all aware of the condition and what drugs I wasn't allowed to have if I got injured. So no like heart increasing drugs or anything. But on reflection, I think we managed the diagnosis quite well. But I'm also lucky that my case wasn't really severe. So I haven't had any major episodes or anything. And I was still able to do absolutely everything without massive risk. But originally, dealing with the diagnosis was difficult, and I think for like a 12 year old, it's quite a lot to take on. But naturally, with time, it just became, I don't know, normal, I guess. And since receiving the diagnosis almost 10 years ago, I've literally not felt limited in any way. And I do manage for us to stay away from, yeah, dangers like Red Bull, cocaine, which isn't that hot, I guess. <laughs> and since the original diagnosis, I've continued to have meetings with my consultant and checkups at the hospital. But the more recent ECGs have been inconclusive and there's an ongoing dispute about whether or not I even have it. So we're kind of debating what to do next. But it's clear my QT isn't normal and nobody really knows what it means. So I only go back to the consultant if I have a strange yet yeah, dodgy episode. But I continue to take beta blockers to mitigate the risks and to live like, I don't know, a non-crazy life. Yeah, I remain grateful that I was diagnosed at the early age, and especially grateful that it was by look. Like, my GP just happened to be screening young people with um, chest pain. And it highlights the importance of screening and of raising awareness of undiagnosed heart conditions. Yeah, it's just a tragedy that so many people get stripped down. And it's, I don't know, just vital that people get to like live life to the full, reach their potential. And before drawing the mini story to a close, I'd like to briefly mention the phenomenal services at Glenfield and other ho hospitals and the service they continue to provide to adults and children. And it'd be like it'd be a travesty if the government continues to like cut services like yeah, the important homes. And thank you to Fionn and Joe and Mike and, and uh, oh I've got my words. Fionn <laughs> and Mike and Steve and Ange just for continuing to raise awareness of SADS and like hosting events like this and educating literally like Leicestershire and so many people. Yeah, it's invaluable. I can't say how much that meant to Jess to be getting a letter from the FA saying she was of international potential at the same time as getting this diagnosis, which was so out of the blue she wasn't expecting it. You know, for her, football was her life at that time, and it was just a really difficult time, I think. Okay, bear with me while we load up the um, video from James Taylor, um, who's relatively recently diagnosed. James Taylor, supporter of the Joe Humphreys Memorial Trust, England player, played for Nottingham and Leicestershire. Um, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, it's a good... Uh, uh, it's a funny starting point. I, well, I started um, very young, achieved what I wanted to achieve in playing for England. Uh, just coming to the peak of my powers almost, just started to s uh, cement myself in that England test side. And I played two years in the ODI side, loving life. Um, and then it hit me hard, should we say. Um, I was practicing at Cambridge uh, and then my my heart started going mental in my chest, shall we say. I was very fortunate enough to survive the initial attack um, and I, to cut a long story short, just warming up at Cambridge for the first game of the season and a little bit of nerve slash anxiety kicked things off in my chest and six hours later, at 10.30 in the morning I thought I was going to die, that's when I thought it was it, um, and I managed to battle through, which was probably the proudest moment of my life, the best achievement I've ever done. Um, battled through six hours and then eventually went to hospital, walked into hospital and got hooked up to the machines and they couldn't believe it, they said it was a miracle that I was able to, one, survive that long and two, um, be able to walk into the hospital. Um, my heart rate was going 265 beats per minute, it had been doing that for a, near on six hours, which is the equivalent of 
five to six marathons in that space of time, which was a, was a pretty good effort. I was pretty proud of it. As somebody who was incredibly fit, when you were at Cambridge in the nets, what were the first signs? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd obviously had anxiety before, which obviously increases your uh, heart rate, and it, my, my heart always hit the wall. Um, beats always hit the wall of my heart pretty, pretty hard, but this was extraordinary. I could see it beating out my shirt, um, and I knew it wasn't right. I was feeling my, my heart, um, and that's when I walked out. I, I walked out, got into the change room, um, stuck my head down the loo, thought I was going to be sick, couldn't be sick, I couldn't breathe. Um, then got on oxygen, etc. And uh, all of this was going on, and I was trying to hide it from my teammates and the opposition. Um, nobody knew for seven. I was in hospital for a week. Nobody knew apart from my teammates. Um, so I did a pretty good job of hiding it. But to say it was uncomfortable um, is a little bit of an understatement. Yeah. What's life like now? You've got uh, some electric components <laughs> yeah. in your in, within your system. Yeah, um, so it took a long time to diagnose. The original diagnosis was ARVC and then we were kind of hoping it was other things, um, different cardiomyopathies or cardio, uh, yeah, different cardiomyopathies, um, some that come on with a virus, an aggressive virus, and uh, that's what I was hoping it was going to be so then it could improve. But obviously that wasn't the case. I got diagnosed with ARVC after a couple of months officially, once my genetic tests had come back, um, I had a, a defibrillator implanted, um, wires screwed into my heart, um, and effectively a mobile phone shoved in my chest, um, which was uncomfortable again, pretty painful. I was on paracetamol for three days after the operation, so no other painkillers. I was feeling so rough after the operation, I didn't want morphine, which would have made me feel even worse. Um, so it was, it was a tough little time to battle through that and then it was a tough six months to get over the operation and now um, I'm feeling a little bit happier in myself. Um, I've taken up golf, uh, loving life and I'm just trying to focus on the things that I can do and not the things that I can't. Um, loving media, uh, loving coaching, playing a lot of golf which is great, a new challenge. Uh, so life's um, better than it was six months ago, put it like that. So do you, do you have a message for, for everybody out there um, uh, and, and a learning from you, a, a message to um, all the medics and the people? Oh yeah, I, I can't thank um, people that have supported me enough. There's, there's, there's millions of people to be fair. Social media is an amazing place. It can be a rough place as a, as a professional sportsman, but um, it's really saved my bacon. Social media has been phenomenal. I mean, I had 20 million tweets in the first two hours of it coming out, uh, and then 60 million after 24 hours uh, about me, which was phenomenal, kept me going. But the, the NHS, the only um, publicity it gets, or the only press it gets, is usually bad press. But they saved my life, and if it wasn't for them, um, I probably wouldn't be here, they were phenomenal the NHS, all the nurses and the doctors in the city hospital that looked after me and my fiance, she was in, stayed every night, I was in hospital for three weeks, she stayed every single night uh, next to me in bed, I even gave her a couple of pillows the first night and she slept on the floor, um, but the, the way they looked after us was, was phenomenal, so I owe a lot to them and obviously the people that you hope are going to be there, the, my friends and family uh, were fantastic as well. James, what can we do to be more heart safe, to ensure that you know we save lives? Um, yeah, I, th I think um, what the trust is doing, trying to enable more uh, defibrillators around the around the country in in areas where people might need them. You, you just never know where people will need a defibrillator to help them out, save their lives. And it, if it's if it means a little bit of money here or there to save somebody's life, it, it's worth it because um, a defibrillator is, in certain places can be priceless. Um, and if it's a matter of a few pounds to save somebody's life, it, it's worth it. So um, we, we should definitely make as much effort and take a little bit more time to raise awareness for these kind of causes. Um, and yeah, definitely get defibrillators out there and teach people a little bit more about CPR um, and 
like I said, a little bit more time and a little bit more money to save somebody's life is, is all worth it. James, thank you for raising awareness and being a supporter of the Joe Humphreys Memorial Trust. Thank you very much, it's brilliant. So James was hoping to be with us today, but he's had another commitment because he's a busy man. And uh, so he did message us uh, yesterday or the day before to say sorry he can't be with us today, but that's his message by video instead. So I hope you enjoyed that. So I'm now going to hand over to Marika, who has the story of another young man, um, Tom Reed, and Tom and his mum Sally, again, uh, because they're a long way away, can't be with us today, but they've sent us a message instead, and she's going to read out Tom's experience and his mother's um, feelings on what happened, and actually, um, having been there herself, because Mariah has actually met Tom and his mum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fionn, for asking me to speak today. Um, so my name is Mariah. I work as a quality improvement lead for research station at Nottingham University Hospitals. You can decide for yourselves what you think that title means. <laughs> I still haven't quite realised it, figured it out. Um, I also work in children's A&E as a staff nurse um, regularly and uh, the weekend Tom Reed collapsed and had a cardiac arrest, I was in children's A&E. Tom was 16 and he was, the red phone that went off was for a trauma call so he wasn't called through for paediatric A&E but I was around at the time. Um, Tom was 16, he was a very keen cyclist, but sponsored by Specialised, um, training hours and hours every week. And he was at an event at Sherwood Forest, uh, like a cycle cross Sherwood Forest event, I don't know what it was called. And he had a cardiac arrest. The trauma call that came through was a 16 year old male who had received blood trauma, bike versus tree, who was being brought in by a helicopter after having been resuscitated at the scene. That was the call that came through. So he didn't come to paediatrics because trauma is from age 16 and above. Paediatric collapses are up to the age of 17, so we didn't get a call for paediatrics. He came in uh, on a spinal board with a collar and sandbags. He wasn't intubated because he'd had trouble intubating the <coughs> scene. And the message was that he was shot seven times, which was interesting, although it could fit with a blood trauma. He was taken to scan within 10 minutes. He had a clear head, chest, neck CT. No injuries, no obvious injuries on the outside. And when his dad arrived after the scan had been performed, uh, it was found that Joe, uh, Joe, so I'm sorry, that Tom had actually not had any, received any trauma, but had collapsed and had a cardiac arrest at the scene. Because it was a cycle event and possibly because he was 16, it took a long time for the ambulance to actually get across the track because they wouldn't stop the race. Um, to get to them, but he had received seven shots at the scene and he had an output when he came back to us. I saw Tom and his mum on the Thursday after this event and I said to Tom, do you remember what happened? Because he was sitting there on his mobile phone in bed. And um, he said, oh yeah, I do remember before the event, but I felt really funny and I'd had a couple of episodes before where I felt really funny. So I cycled towards the crowd and what happened next is that he, he stopped his bike, cycled towards the crowd, stopped his bike, got off his bike, took off his helmet and then collapsed and had a cardiac arrest. How the story then became that of a bike versus tree blood trauma, nobody will ever know. But that's how the confusion sort of set in. But Tom survived and that was a picture that he found of him being flown from the scene to the hospital. Um, and. Uh, I've got an email from his mum just to say what their life's been like since and I've got a little message from Tom himself as well that I'll read out to you. Um, so, shall I read Sally's message first? Um, Sally, Sally, Tom's mum said, she's very sorry to be unable to be here today but I'd like to share a brief outline of our story. In April 2015, our son Tom, aged 16, suffered a cardiac arrest during a cycling competition in Nottingham Forest. We have no family history of heart disease, and it was totally unexpected for us and a shock to the fact um, expected for us and a shock. Um, and we are grateful to the fantastic staff in Nottingham who treated him. We're an active family of five, living on the south coast, and Tom, our middle son, was a keen cyclist. His ambition was to race in the Tour de France. He trained very hard and he'd been told he was very talented and I believe he'd reached a very high level of fitness. 
In April 2015, he attended a mountain bike race in Nottingham Forest. However, during his first lap, he began to feel very poorly. Tom knew that something was very wrong and he needed to get off his bike. Luckily, he had the foresight to cycle to a corner where he could see some people. He got off his, he got off his bike, took his helmet off, and then blacked out. He was on the ground for an hour being given CPR by some people at the scene, and then finally a defib arrived. They shocked him seven times, and then he was taken by helicopter to Nottingham Hospital. I believe the full trauma team were called, suspecting him to have had some sort of head, head or chest injury. It wasn't until later on that it transpired he had suffered a cardiac arrest. We were not with him at the time, but Mariah Kinney's reading this was, and I'm happy for her to explain the thoughts of those involved when he was first brought in. We first saw Tom in intensive care later that evening and were given the news that no parent wants to hear. He'd suffered a cardiac arrest and his chances were very slim. He would either die when they woke him from the coma or be totally paralysed. His siblings should travel up immediately to say goodbye. The night was awful, as you can imagine, and several times I thought we would lose him. Our son, however, defied all odds and survived. The doctor said his extreme level of fitness had saved him, but it might have also caused the arrest in the first place. After three weeks in hospital, both in Nottingham and Southampton General, it was decided that he should be fitted with an ICD, although not given any medication, and then we came home. Tom seemed to be suffering a few side effects immediately after, after such as slight speech difficulties, memory loss, and an incidental tremor. He was however meant to be sitting as GCSEs, but that was not going to be an option. This did delight Tom, as he's not keen on exams. The GCSE dilemma was a fight, as we believed that repeating a year would not be the right option for Tom. We were very lucky though, and his school were amazing and fought the exam boards to secure him as many GCSEs as possible, based on his coursework, and he sat as maths at home. And yes, Mareg, I did ask this question, the school do have an AED. During all of this, a moving house, family and friends did, um, did a St. John's Ambulance first aid course and they were so amazed by Tom's story, he was asked to do a piece for South Today, our local news channel. Partly because his story was so unusual, but also to raise awareness about the importance of being able to perform basic first aid. Our biggest concern at this time, other than his heart, was keeping him mentally upbeat. I can't compliment everyone, everyone enough for his care, but sometimes the mental state of the patient is forgotten and I was very aware that if he slipped into depression, he would have a very big problem. Cycling was his life, and he was now ill and being advised not to cycle, and certainly never to compete again. So two weeks after coming out of hospital, we let him get back on his bike and go for a 15-mile ride in, the com in company. Then he started to train for a local 10-mile trial in December. Although he wasn't training to win, he was out on his bike quite a lot. People said we were mad letting him do this, and his consultant was not really advising it, but Tom needed to do it. The gamble paid off, he completed the race, and he was happy. Unfortunately, his heart was still putting in some interesting rhythms, so he's put on to a low dose of beta blockers. The last two years have been a roller coaster of emotions for the whole family. We've all been screened and tested for heart conditions, and none have been found. Everyone thought that Tom might have a condition called ARVC, but a recent referral to a geneticist and a blood test shows no signs of this. However, we continue to have regular hospital appointments. His ICD has never gone off, so I guess he just continues to be monitored. I'm not sure that anybody really knows why Tom's heart is the way that it is. All I know is his mum is that he wants to lead a normal life and not be noticed. You would have no idea if you met him in the street that he had any problems. He continues to windsurf, water ski, sail, road bike, and mountain bike, play squash, and much more. He knows his limits and he likes the beta blockers because he says it stops him pushing his heart rate too high, yet he can still push himself. Of course he would like to compete again, but at the moment that really isn't an option. He passed his driving test shortly after his 17th birthday and he's just about to finish his second year in sixth form. Who knows what the future holds, and it's not been easy. The whole family have all suffered in one way or another, and we've shed many tears. However, everyone we've met along the way has been amazing, and the care he has received has been fantastic. We are very lucky to have many caring family and friends that have helped Tom through this. I would say that he still has times when he's sad because of the loss of his cycling, and the future is uncertain, but giving up is not an option. So that message came from Sally, Tom's mum. Um, and Tom himself then emailed me and said, yes, I have an ICD now, that was one of my questions. After my accident, I was back onto my bike two weeks after coming out of Southampton Hospital. 
I've cycled ever since, not to the level that I used to ride, but I'm still a keen cyclist and I still cycle regularly. I'm not able to race anymore or train as much as I used to be able to due to my heart condition. Saying this, I completed a 10 mile time trial eight months after my arrest on Boxing Day and I've cycled up to 80 miles on my bike in one, in one go since coming out of hospital. I would like to train more and race again, but I have to keep my heart rate down and on beta blockers which help me to do this. Although I'm not able to race my bike, my heart condition doesn't stop me from doing anything else. I'm keen on water sports and always have been even before my arrest and I've continued to windsurf, wakeboard, water ski, sail. I've always been a keen skier and snowboarder and I've only just got back from a skiing holiday in France. I also ride horses with my girlfriend regularly. Recently I've been going swimming a couple of times a week for an hour to go and I've also participated in circuits at my local leisure centre and I've been playing squash and badminton a couple of times a week as well. I still cycle regularly both road and mountain bike and I'm living life to the full. My heart condition and my arrest haven't stopped me from doing anything really apart from competing, uh, from competing and being as extremely fit as I was at the time of the arrest. I take part in all kinds of sports and activities and I've never had a problem with any of them. Um, and you would like to thank everybody in Nottingham and I know there's a few people here who looked after Tom and you would like to thank everybody for the care that we gave him in Nottingham. So that's Tom. And I think what this, this story from Tom and from his mum highlights is that it's very nice to see people who survive cardiac arrest or events like James Taylor or Mwamba, but life will never ever be the same again. And there's a lot to, to deal with and to live through, to be able to live that normal life, probably especially when you're a teenager, when you just want to not be different from anybody else. Uh, so I'm really pleased that he, he was willing to, to email me back. So thank you very much. That's a great story, and, and a, a lot similar to Jess's story, and that wanted to still live life to its full within parameters that are not, not quite the same as they used to be. And I love the psychology, the beta blockers will cap my heart rate, therefore I can push myself as hard as I need to. That's 18 year old psychology for you, isn't it? <laughs> Um, another thing that happened is because he was unaware of his helicopter ride, and so he was uh, he was flown in a helicopter to the school prom by a local businessman who'd heard his story and thought, you missed out your, your memory of a helicopter, I'll fly into the prom. <laughs> um, okay, so I thought those stories might help you understand um, what this is all about, uh, but also that, you know, that, that you are never the same again when you get this diagnosis. And it's very easy for us to focus on cardiac MRIs and this, that, and the other, and what medication people should be on. But actually, this, you know, the psychological element of this is important too. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the workshop.